to this uh, session, this ministerial session this afternoon on the role of green hydrogen manufacturing and trade. Of course, in the context of the positive green growth agenda that our President, His Excellency William Ruto, so eloquently articulated this morning. My name is Richard Kiplagat. I'm the chair of the African Hydrogen, Task, African Hydrogen Partnership Task Force um, for Advocacy. And the Africa Hydrogen Partnership is a multi-stakeholder industry body, a pan-African industry body that has about 28 members um, spanning academia, industry, developers, financial institutions, um, and consultants that are all working very hard to educate the public about the potential of green hydrogen, to ensure that the appropriate policies and regulations are in place to catalyze the growth of, this, of green the green hydrogen economy, and to um, be, work proactively to see uh, an accelerated pace of green hydrogen adoption across the, across the continent. Next slide, please. So what we're going to be doing today is we um, are going to have a, a panel conversation with the ministers, but they asked me to first uh, lay down a little bit of scene setting, just to give you some uh, context around what we're talking about here. And the first thing that we will be looking at is obviously the immense renewable energy that, that Africa holds. And I'll unpack that a little bit and give you some context in, 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 uh, uh, with regards to the quantum and the scale of our renewable energy potential. Secondly, we'll be talking about this thing called green hydrogen. What is it? And why is it relevant in the context of our renewable energy potential? And then we'll speak to the opportunity that green hydrogen presents to create jobs, to increase revenues and the GDP of African countries, to reduce emissions, and to provide core anchor demand for renewable energy and, uh, and accelerate the need for universal access. So let's first move to the, ne the next slide. Let's talk about the renewable energy potential of the continent of Africa. And I must say, when I saw this research from our colleagues at CAPA who, who provided us with some of this data, I was actually quite astounded. We, on this continent, are endowed with wind, hydro, geothermal and solar potential. And it is estimated that by the year 2040, Africa could produce 50 times more energy just from renewable potential, renewable energy that we have on this continent than the world's estimated demand. It's a phenomenal number. It's a phenomenal number. And we would be able to provide energy access for all Africans by 2030, as the president indicated this morning, at 30% lower cost and with 80% lower emissions. And so one might ask ourselves, what are we doing with all of this renewable energy potential? It's like having money in a bank account, but not having a check leaf to withdraw any of it. And that is actually the challenge that this continent is facing. With regards to the biggest source of renewable energy, next slide please, that is by a long way our solar energy potential. It is estimated that we have close to 10 terawatts of potential solar, watt energy, solar power energy. It is also unique in the sense 
and again, as articulated very eloquently by the president this morning, in the sense that this solar energy is consistent and relatively consistent throughout the calendar year. So we don't have the seasonality that geographies and uh, geographies such as, such as Europe experiences. So we're able to, 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 to utilize solar power and solar energy throughout the year. It's, it's estimated as an example that solar systems in Tanzania could support a 57% larger base load than the same system in Spain as a result of this particular uh, analogy. And in addition to that, that system would require a, the, the system in Spain would require a battery six times larger than the battery uh, in Tanzania. So you can see that there's a tremendous competitive advantage that African renewable energy, energy holds. Now, the opportunity for this is to use this renewable energy to separate hydrogen and oxygen from water. Now, electrolysis, we have all heard of before. And it's actually a well-established, long-standing technology. The difference today is where do you get that electricity? When you get the electricity that drives electrolysis, you get hydrogen that does not have any CO2 emissions. And it is absolutely critical that we utilize this source of new fuel to power the green industrial revolution of the future. But of course, there are some skeptics. On the next slide, please. Of course, there are people who say that green hydrogen is too expensive today. They also say that because green hydrogen, to, to produce green hydrogen, you require water, and water is increasingly a scarce resource, it is, it is a um, potential risk to the livelihoods of, of, uh, of citizens and populations. Fortunately, with regards to both those concerns, we can see that green hydrogen production, and some of the panelists today will speak to that, can be placed in the coastlines of the continent and can use desalination, water desalination processes to drive green hydrogen production, thereby mitigating any risks associated with utilization of scarce water resources. Secondly, with regards to cost, and we will again explore this, we are seeing significant drops in the cost of producing green hydrogen year on year. And so, with regards to all these challenges, we know that this is indeed a new sector and that is, it is transformative. But we also know that any challenges that it is facing, any challenges that it faces, are well within range of mitigation within a relatively short period of time. So let me switch to the transformative potential of green hydrogen. And let me quickly give you two examples of where we see green hydrogen addressing opportunities to create jobs, to increase the GDP of countries, to reduce emissions, and um, and, and, and to anchor uh, demand for additional renewable energy and energy access. The first one on the next slide is, is the opportunity that iron ore and the production of green steel offers the continent. Ironically, Africa produces 77 million tons of, of iron ore annually. That accounts for less than 1% of global steel production. 
And paradoxically, Africa then imports 6 million tons of steel. So you can see straight away there's an opportunity. We know also that 40% of new city dwellers globally will be in African cities. And those African cities will need to build additional buildings that will have increased demand for steel. So there is an opportunity to reduce transportation costs, to onshore manufacturing, to use green hydrogen to provide the extreme heat that is required for steel production in Africa, and thereby to create an estimated 24,000 direct jobs and 215,000 indirect jobs, delivering an incremental $20 billion of revenue to the continent and providing anchor demand for energy access and bankability of 20 gigawatts for Africa. And so you can see there's a real opportunity there to utilize green hydrogen as a fuel for green industry and onshoring green industry. The last example I want to share with you, on the next slide please, is the utilization of bauxite and smelting bauxite to create green aluminum. We know that there is a significant amount of bauxite on the continent. In fact, 98% of uh, Africa's bauxite comes from Guinea, and almost all of it is exported unprocessed. Utilizing green energy at scale could produce green aluminum and save 335 million tons of CO2 every year, which would be close to 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. It would create 60,000 new direct jobs and nearly 280,000 new jobs, um, uh, new indirect jobs could be created. In addition to that, it would deliver, deliver $37 billion of additional revenue for Africa and be an anchor to drive energy access on the continent. So ladies and gentlemen, I think you will agree with me that as we think about the huge renewable energy potential that Africa possesses, in order to write the check to withdraw the money in that bank account, we need to use green hydrogen to unlock new opportunities, to drive new green industries, to create base load and anchor demand for energy access, to reduce emissions for hard to abate industries such as steel and aluminum smelting, and to help not only Africa, but the globe combat climate change. So with that, I would like to invite our esteemed panel this morning, this afternoon, it's already afternoon, um, and I'd like to ask you to welcome to the stage uh, the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Energy, Mr. Alex Washira, Karibu Bona Washira. Please welcome Mr. Washira. Please also uh, help me to welcome the Honorable Minister for Electricity in the Presidency, Republic of South Africa, Minister Nkosi. Welcome, Minister. Thank 
And last but not least, please uh, give a warm welcome to the Minister for Economy and Sustainable Development from Mauritania, Honorable uh, Saleh. Welcome, Minister Saleh. So, uh, welcome to our esteemed, esteemed panel. Um, speaking to, to the uh, opening remarks and uh, the scene setting, Perhaps I could, uh, I could turn to uh, our host, P.S. Uh, Washira, and, uh, and just perhaps to begin with, if you could just share uh, with us how Kenya seeks to exploit the potential of green hydrogen and the opportunity that green hydrogen presents. Uh, thank you, Richard, for... You have clearly illustrated uh, the ways in how that we can be able to utilize our green hydrogen. You have clearly enumerated the areas in which uh, Africa stands uh, to gain and the kind of jobs that Africa stands to create and the kind of resources that Africa stands to earn by uh, getting into green hydrogen space. Now, Kenya, we are not left behind. Our president, Dr. William Samoy Ruto, clearly illustrated that we do have about 93% of our energy as clean energy, mainly driven by geothermal, which uh, constitutes about 49% of our renewable energy and total uh, build capacity, and followed by hydro, uh, wind, and, and solar in, the, in that order. Uh, in terms of now using Kenya is in the forefront. One, we are almost uh, done with the green hydrogen strategy, the country framework. Number two is that we are, because of now our renewable energy uh, potential, we want now to get into the production of green hydrogen. And we are not only talking about production, we are also talking about manufacturing of electrolyzers because uh, we have been importing most of our items, but it's about time that we also talk about uh, how do we also manufacture the electrolyzers that are going to be the key in, uh, critical ingredient in manufacturing of green hydrogen. And also, uh, uh, water, most of the African water that can be used for manufacturing of green hydrogen is uh, water from the ocean, and we know very well that water from the ocean is uh, uh, salty, and it, therefore it needs desalination. So we're also talking of how do we desalinate the water, what can we produce in Kenya that we can export to our brother and sister countries across Africa, and that is the desalination equipment as well as the electrolyzers. So we are not only looking at producing uh, green hydrogen for manufacturing and export, uh, but we are also looking at uh, producing and exporting the electrolyzers to ensure that we become also an exporting country. Thank you, uh, Kiplaga. Thank you, thank you. I think that's that's interesting uh, that you mentioned that you are developing a uh, green hydrogen roadmap. Um, is there anything else you could tell us about that roadmap and what does what does that roadmap entail in terms of where uh, how we want to how we want to how we want to go forward with regards to, to green hydrogen. There is a reason why I am, uh, I, I do not want to let the cat out of the bag <laughs> yet, because tomorrow is when now we shall let you know the details of the green hydrogen strategy. So allow me not to diverge a lot of details and create some suspense in you, such that you can be able to join us tomorrow at midday as we launch the strategy. Okay, all right. Sorry to have preempted, uh, to, to have preempted that, that, that launch. 
maybe just one, one follow-up question is um, one, of the, the, uh, one of the opportunities that green hydrogen presents as a, as a, as a fuel is the byproduct uh, of green ammonia. And I know that that's something that uh, Kenya has been uh, looking into. Um, kindly just uh, speak to us about uh, the opportunity that green ammonia presents for Kenya, the link to perhaps our agricultural sector, and, 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 uh, and I think very importantly, the, um, the offtake, the local offtake as a, as a key driver for the development of green hydrogen in Kenya. Uh, thank you, uh, Kiplagan, once again. Kenya is looking to substitute about 50% of our nitrogen uh, fertilizers with green alternatives by 2030. And so, therefore, Kenya is ready to offtake uh, the green ammonia, the green fertilizer that is going to be produced uh, for industrialization and promoting economic growth as well as job creation. Uh, beyond the energy sector. So we are looking at green hydrogen, not only as, uh, as the fuel part of it, but also uh, the byproducts. Again, I forgot to mention that as we move towards production of green hydrogen, we are also looking towards manufacturing of solar panels and also wind turbines. Because uh, Africa is endowed in uh, uh, enough terawatt hours of solar, as well as enough uh, gigawatt hours of uh, wind. And so therefore, because Africa mainly has been uh, uh, importing those two, uh, the wind turbines as well as solar panels, then it's about time that as we gear towards manufacturing of green hydrogen, uh, then we also manufacture the solar panels and we also manufacture the wind turbines so that we produce the green hydrogen and offtake in terms of uh, green hydrogen in production of ammonia such that we reduce our nitrogen uh, uh, based uh, uh, fertilizers to green uh, fertilizer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, PS. Just turning to you, Mr. Minister Nkosi. Um, South Africa has made significant strides in terms of planning, development of, of uh, green hydrogen uh, valley and, and roadmap. Please tell us a little bit about how your own vision uh, has unfolded and some of the lessons that we in this room could learn as Africans from uh, the trailblazing that you've, uh, you've, you've, you've done in South Africa. Uh, thank you very much uh, and once more good uh, afternoon to everyone in the house and uh, fellow panelists. I think your, um, your opening remarks are particularly useful in surfacing the potential of uh, green hydrogen. So the first one is that um, it's driven by sovereign interest and in this instance at least the South African experience is to ensure that uh, in the course of the exploitation of this uh, uh, fuel source, we are able to address um, strategic sovereign objectives like uh, universal access uh, and ensuring that we are able to industrialize on the back of uh, this opportunity. And we are beginning to provide a concrete meaning to the just energy transition we are giving its South African characteristics. So that's the first part. The second one is uh, we don't see ourselves as an island. We think that it is important that uh, countries uh, on the African continent, and in this instance, Sub-Saharan Africa, should uh, seek to aggregate their efforts. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with uh, our neighbor in uh, Namibia, trying to develop, if you like, a green hydrogen corridor because we think that uh, the uh, significant amount of opportunities that uh, can be achieved uh, on the basis of aggregation uh, and scale. So we are undermining both the administrative and political boundaries and we are seeing beyond uh, just those uh, limitations. The third one is uh, the indispensable nature of the private sector given their agility, they are sitting on a, a big pool of liquidity, some of them have uh, advanced uh, uh, technology. So it's important that there has to be collaboration and cooperation between the public and private sector. So we don't see that as a binary conversation. There's a point of uh, intersection. So we're working with the private sector to ensure that we are able to create uh, the necessary regulatory environment that uh, 
can propel the exploitation of, uh, of green hydrogen. So we have uh, developed a green hydrogen commercialization strategy that is uh, anchored on uh, six pillars. Uh, first, we do see the importance of uh, the domestic market. We have uh, some of the most uh, prominent and marquee companies in the country that have began to transition. And this is largely on the back of uh, their existential questions that are confronting them. We do anticipate that the most industrialized uh, Western countries are likely going to introduce uh, carbon borders. So I think what these firms are beginning to do is to, to reposition themselves in anticipation of that eventuality so that uh, they don't lose out on those, uh, on those markets. So you see that uh, companies like Anglo-American, uh, they've uh, developed uh, a, what we call the Green Hydrogen Valley. They've already uh, starting to commercialize uh, the retrofitting of uh, uh, some of the big trucks, uh, the form of propulsion. They are moving from combustion engine and going the green hydrogen route. We're seeing a, a big uh, company like Sasol, which is essentially the biggest polluter in the country. They do see the future, their obligation to the environment and, um, and, and, and also to posterity. They are beginning to infuse, uh, if you like, uh, bring into uh, on board uh, the exploitation of new renewable resources. So what we're doing is to to collaborate with them because we think that working together we will be able to fashion the most comprehensive, cogent, and um, efficacious response on uh, what uh, the green hydrogen agenda um, um, uh, uh, poses. And then also there's uh, issues around the uh, industrialization on the back of uh, this uh, green hydrogen agenda, uh, so we're doing a lot of work given the significant amount of deposits, especially on the platinum group of metals between ourselves and our neighbors in the North Zimbabwe. We've got over 80% of the known deposits of PGM. So it's important that we don't um, export our resource uh, in the most unrefined fashion, but we are able to introduce the uh, capabilities internally working with the private sector to ensure that we are able to exploit this resource. And in this way, we are able to illustrate to the general public the relationship between this decarbonization agenda and their own selfish uh, benefits and also the benefits of the country so that the conversation around green hydrogen is not left to the enlightened, uh, the boardroom discussions and, and those who are part of the political and, uh, and business elite, but is able to make that connection with ordinary people. And in that way, you are democratizing the conversation and you are increasing the participation rate. And that's how we see the pathway of uh, green hydrogen. So those are some of the key elements for us that we think are sacrosanct uh, in the exploitation of this resource. Uh, speed is important. Doing is important. I think we've been discussing and discussing. We should get to a point where we get to do. And of course, we are likely going to make mistakes as we do, we'll rectify those mistakes. It's those that uh, do that are likely going to make mistakes. Otherwise, we can fold our arms and allow this uh, resource to be exploited by other people. So it is in our collective interest that we work together to exploit the resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you made some, some really important points there, you know, particularly with regards to democratizing the, the conversation and making sure that uh, we, we, we carry the uh, population along. Um, I recently uh, read that um, there's a new green hydrogen fund that has been uh, put together. Could you put, just unpack to us how, what that fund looks like and, 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 and how the resources um, will be applied to accelerating uh, green hydrogen projects in South Africa? Well, yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think financing is going to be a major part uh, of the work that we're doing. So that's a one billion, rent, uh, one billion US dollar fund. Uh, so we want to achieve a number of things. So uh, ensure that there's uh, great levels of appetite to invest upstream of the project life cycle. So we know that uh, a lot of this uh, technology is, um, is still in its nascent stages. So it's important that we are able to uh, invest in, um, in these uh, technologies upstream, uh, um, pre-feasibility studies. Uh, the state must also illustrate its commitment by putting the skin in the game. Uh, the state is prepared to take the first loss and we want to use this uh, 
a financing instrument, uh, if you like, facility to make it possible for us to advance this project to get closer to financial close. So risk appetite, it's important. Uh, so we, we really are trying to address that, uh, that part of, uh, of the work. The second one is that uh, we need to develop a capability uh, on the part of, uh, in the arena of uh, project management, if you like, uh, the state doesn't necessarily sit with a monopoly of skills on what is required for you to put together a very aggressive and ambitious agenda that the green hydrogen is about. So it's important that you are able to create this facility, aggregate the skills, working with the private sector so that uh, jointly we can see how best to exploit this resource. So they re really the facility is to, is to do exactly that, uh, for us to be able to accelerate, if you like, uh, the advancement of the project um, along the project uh, life cycle. We do accept that uh, there's a significant number of these projects that are at pre-feasibility studies. We are very um, 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 uh, encouraged in South Africa that we've got about nine concrete projects uh, on, in the green hydrogen front, and, and one of the most advanced is already at the stage of uh, implementation and like uh, uh, the secretary was saying we're seeing opportunities with regards to uh, the variants, uh, what you, you can achieve out of uh, green hydrogen, the issues around uh, uh, green ammonia, which will be used for fertilizer production. Uh, as you know, we, we are a big part, the big part of our economy is around the primary agriculture, and a lot of uh, the inflation we're seeing on the food side is really important uh, inflation on account of the cost, the uh, exponential rise in the cost of, uh, of uh, fertilizer prices. So it's important that we look at those key ingredients who are able to domesticate them and we insulate ourselves from this uh, price uh, fluctuation, commodity fluctuation, currency fluctuation. And in this way, we are able to make sure that we achieve uh, food security, not less really about the food being available, but essentially about the affordability of uh, food uh, uh, on the shelves in the big retailers. So we see this as a broader agenda. So that facility is going to help us in the main to be able to achieve those things. No, that's, that's, that's excellent. Um, yeah, I see the, I see the need um, and, and in clear commitment uh, that the government has, has, has made together with other actors to put together a fund to help catalyze. And I think uh, we can learn quite a lot from from that, uh, you know, the development of projects, early stage feasibilities, financing, uh, skills development, capacity, etc. So I, th I think that's that's really helpful. Um, turning to to Minister Saleh, um, I see that Mauritania has, I think, a pipeline of 100 billion dollars uh, of of uh, projects that uh, um, you aim to to implement. Um, just to segue from the financing uh, element, um, how does Mauritania see itself uh, uh, getting access to the kind of resources that are needed to implement the projects that you have in your plan? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for making us, uh, giving us the opportunity to be part of this conversation. I, I think this conversation fits extremely well uh, the framework that President Rutus um, articulated this morning, uh, which is looking at the opportunities that the climate action is offering to the African countries. Let me first start by uh, one question. Why, why, why all the stuff about uh, uh, green hydrogen? Why are we talking so much about green hydrogen? We are talking about uh, hydrogen because it is uh, an energy source that can replace the fossil fuel energy in all its usage. It can be used for transportation, it can be used in this industry, it can be used for electricity, and therefore, for the first time, we have a source of energy that is carbon-free and can, that can replace the fossil fuel. The second uh, reason, uh, the uh, uh, International uh, Energy uh, 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 Agency uh, in its uh, landmark report of 2019 uh, ahead of the Glasgow, uh, said if the world cannot increase the production and consumption of green hydrogen 
to reach approximately 10 to 15 percent of the global uh, production and consumption of energy, there is no way we will achieve the 1.5 degree Celsius target. So we have to be very clear, green hydrogen is absolutely an imperative. It's not, we cannot just, forget, we cannot just put it aside, despite all the complex problems, technical problems, the transportation problems, the issues that are still uh, unresolved. Now, now, why Africa? Uh, Africa, as you know, uh, is uh, home to almost 40% of the solar radiation, some of the best solar radiation in the world, and it's the place where probably hydrogen can be produced at the cheapest cost. Uh, looking at Mauritania in particular, Mauritania has a mixture of uh, solar and wind energy that are unique almost on the planet. It's uh, in the northwest part of the country, you have one of the spots, rare spot on Earth, where you have both wind blowing at 9 to 11 meters per second, and you have solar energy in a desertic and arid area, underpopulated and close to the sea. So it's a perfect place to produce renewable energy 24 hours a day, all year long. And it's probably the best place to produce energy at uh, green hydrogen at the lower scale. It happens that not far from there are also the iron ore mining uh, uh, mines. And then iron ore, you know that the iron ore, the steel industry in general, is responsible for 10% of the greenhouse gas emission. And until now, it has proven extremely difficult to abate. But green hydrogen offers extraordinary possibility to produce green steel. Therefore, rather than not only free of carbon, but in the process, you will produce even water. And the good thing about this, all these nature-based solutions that rather than producing side effect in a way, you produce synergies. In the process of producing green hydrogen, you will also produce millions of tons of water in the northwest part of the country, which is a desertic camp, and therefore giving water to the population in the urban, rural, and even for the livestock. So this is why in Mauritania, despite having uh, vast gas resources, today we have set, uh, and our president has set one clear objective, is to establish Mauritania as a green hub, for, as a hub for low carbon energy and for green minerals. This is where all our policy is directed towards uh, now. And the uh, uh, private sector around the world seems to have uh, also bought in this strategy. As you have mentioned, we have four developers that have signed uh, agreements with Mauritania, uh, producing uh, uh, something around between 10 gigawatt to 30, the biggest one of them, uh, gigawatt of, of uh, electricity for the green hydrogen uh, by uh, the horizon of 2035 or 2040. This, this project will be certainly implemented over 10 to 15 years, and it costs us 100 billion. But let me stop on one thing. Uh, we have uh, co co commissioned a study with one of the developers on the impact, economic, macroeconomic impact. A high-level macroeconomic impact shows that in the process of producing 30 gigawatt of energy, you will uh, halve the unemployment rate by 50 percent. You will put the country on a trajectory that will put the economic growth at 10 percent. You will make the country net exporter now with a positive commercial balance than a deficit. It's absolutely a game changer for Africa. Green hydrogen has the potential not only to address the climate change, but also to address the other big challenge that the world is facing, which is poverty and unemployment. And in our population, you cannot sell the climate change uh, agenda alone. The population in Africa will buy only the climate change agenda if it's also an, an, um, uh, an employment and economic growth and an equality agenda. And green hydrogen as a technology has a possibility to contribute to that. And in the process, in that same study, you will give uh, uh, electricity at four cents the kilowatt to the population. And today it costs 17 cents of dollar. You are simply reducing the, uh, the cost of electricity 
three, four times. And this will give reliable industry to reliable electricity affordable to the industrial sector. And if Africa is lagging behind, essentially, it's because simply we are lagging behind in terms of access to energy and we are lagging behind in productivity and industry. And let me hear, because, because it's very important, if uh, we don't address the problem of productivity and energy, you will not solve the migration problem. We have this conversation on the migration has been there for four or five decades. But the simple reality, if you have a country that is rich and with a lot of capital, and a country that has a lot of labor but not enough capital, you put them together and they are trading, either the capital needs to move to the country that have low labor, or the labor will move to the country that have, uh, that have a lot of capital. This is the reality, and today, betting, making a bet on renewable energy and on green hydrogen and on industrializing Africa on an access and a rapid, a quick access to affordable energy has also the potential of addressing at its root the migration problem. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Minister. I know I did not respond to your question. You, you, but <laughs> you did. But I know you have a, pub, a panel of the private sector. We yeah. signed with them. They, they, it's up to them to bring the money. Not, not, <laughs> not, not to, no, uh, to be frank, yes, we have to, be, we have, to have that partnership, public-private, to mobilize such scale of resources. When we talk about 100, 200, 900 billion, that is what will be required for us, Kenya, South Africa, and the six members of the AGA, African Green Hydrogen Alliance, you know, Egypt, Morocco, uh, Mauritania, Namibia, South Africa, and Kenya. Uh, we'll need something like now $900 million, it's too, a lot of money. But yeah. if you compare it to the, to, the, to, the, to, to the money flowing in the energy sector as a whole, in the oil sector, you will see it's not even 2% of that. So, the so money it's is big available. for us, but it's a little uh, if we are just trying to capture part of the money that is today flowing to the uh, to fossil the fuel and the recycling. It to the, and for that, we need a very strong public partnership we need to continue to advocate. We need the multilateral bank to be, to, to be on board. We need to de-risk the capital, the private capital to Africa. It was mentioned this morning also by President Ruti. Ruti we, we pay more or less four to seven times more the cost of capital in Africa than in uh, developing countries, Europe or, or the US, and that is absolutely one of the biggest issues. We need to reassure the private uh, uh, sector, and we had uh, a workshop we hold in workshop from fewer I'm sure uh, yeah. Jonas Moberg will, will, will may talk about it. I can see it here. Yeah. So maybe okay. one of the what, what we should do then is uh, is bring the private sector on board. It's clear that that is a, a key a key enabler. Um, let me invite my my friend uh, Jonas Moberg, who is the uh, chief executive of the Africa Hydrogen Alliance, and the panelists. Uh, Carol Karaoke, Margaret Karaoke, who is CEO of KEPSA, Margaret Mushler, uh, Vice President uh, of CWP, Nicolas Leconte, Director of HDF Energy, and Brew Ayale Terfi, who is the President of Africa for Fortescue. Welcome. A big applaud for those amazing presentations. <laughs> now you sit here. You sit there. That's great. Thank you so much. That is fantastic. This is fundamentally, we have heard why this needs to be done. We've heard about the potential. We have heard about the fact that this is not about 